everybody. All survived Affiliate Summit so far. Not much longer to go. Um, like the introduction said, I'm an attorney with uh, Center Law Group. I'm actually not a partner yet, but we're working on that. I'm a senior attorney there. Um, and uh, we do, among other things, help, co help uh, affiliate marketers, uh, networks, merchants with uh, contracts, FTC compliance, IP compliance, things like that. So how many people here have been to a presentation given by a lawyer before? You? Okay. We'll try to do things a little differently today. If you've seen the slideshow online already, you'll see I don't really have any cases cited in there and uh, in here, and uh, there's not a lot of uh, legal stuff in there. We like to have a little bit of fun. Yes, the law can be fun at times, and we're going to try to do that. So um, just to start off, there are three important areas for any company, whether you're an affiliate marketer, a network, a merchant to focus on, um, and uh, this is the three parts of the presentation. Um, one, you want to ensure predictability, and that's why contracts are important. And that's why it's really important to understand what the contracts that you have say they are. And I'm going to illustrate this point with my uber predictable cat back at home, and uh, I'll show you what I mean in a minute. You also want to manage risks. Uh, what legal risks are out there? And uh, we're in Las Vegas, obviously. Some of you may not know that because you're working so hard. You haven't had time to go to the casino or do anything like that, but we're going to illustrate that with the casino. And the third thing we're going to talk about is corporate incubation. Now, there are a lot of risks outside of your company, and there are actually risks within your company that you have to manage. And uh, we're going to illustrate that with, yes, a 15-week-old fetus, which happens to be um, my future child, whatever, male or female, we don't know yet. And yes, I am the father of that child, so I've been told. So uh, just, a, just a few things to lighten up the mood here we'll, as we go along. So those are the three topics right there, my cat, the casino, and a fetus. So enjoy. <laughs> so um, talking about my cat for a second, and this will be relevant, believe it or not. Um, she's an amazing little thing. She's seven pounds of fury. Um, she still acts like a kitten, though she's four or five years old, we think. And we rescued her from a shelter a few years back. And uh, she has a little quirk. Depending on how you pet her, she squeaks a certain way. If you pet her a certain way, she squeaks 99% of the time. So you pet her this way, and she goes, squeak. If you, don't, if you pet her a different way, she never squeaks, right? 99% um, of the time in your businesses, if you have a contract or don't have a contract, it doesn't matter because people act fairly predictably 99% of the time. There's always that 1% of the time where it's not predictable. 1% of the time, she doesn't squeak when you pet her that way, and it always bums me out when it happens. But it bums me out when companies don't have the right contracts or don't understand the contracts that they have. So I guess the question is, would you trust my cat to squeak? And if the answer is not 100% of the time, then you should have a contract or you should understand the contracts that you have. And we'll go through that a little more specifically. So um, here are the players in the field, of course. You will probably are all very, very well aware of that. Uh, you have merchants, and there are other players too. And if you're a merchant, you should know how your products are marketed and under what conditions. You should be aware of can spam and ensure can spam compliance. And uh, you should set payment amounts, how cost per click, cost per action, whatever it is. Um, and then, of course, there are networks. And uh, by the way, how many people here are merchants? Anybody? OK, one. Uh, how many people here are networks? And any affiliates? OK, so I'll try to focus this a little more on affiliates, since most people here are affiliates. But I won't forget about the merchants or merchant and the networks. Um, so you have per cost per action, cost per click. With networks, you want to keep it control over the affiliates, uh, over their marketing practices, if you can. You want to ensure compliance with the marketing agreements. And also, you want to set up website contracts. That's very important. Privacy policy, terms and conditions. Um, privacy policies, the common question I always get about privacy policies is, is it necessary? And are terms necessary? And the answer is they're not always necessary. Um, there are certain conditions where they are, and there are certain ones where they're not. Um, if you may have heard about, uh, and I'm going to talk about this more uh, a little bit later, but Delta's gotten a lot of trouble recently because they had a mobile app that didn't have a privacy policy. Um, and under their California-specific law, they were supposed to have one, and they didn't. 
So um, there are times when you have to have them, but sometimes they're more trouble than they're worth. And I'm talking myself out of business right now, but sometimes they are. And you're better off not having them. Uh, with affiliates, of course, you want to get the terms and conditions of the uh, marketing and how payments are, are set up. And you also want to have website contracts yourself to the extent that they're necessary. So um, one thing, one word on affiliates, and I'm going to talk about this again a little bit later. But it's one thing to have a contract. It's another thing to understand what the contract says. And this is what I always tell people who don't like to read contracts, because there's only one person in this room that likes to read contracts, and that's me. I know that already. And uh, the contracts that you have, it's really good to go through the contract one time, see what it says, and write down like a bullet list of the things that you can and can't do, and always have that by your side uh, when dealing with, these, with the, these different parties. And by doing that, you ensure yourself that you've complied with the contract without having to read the contract over and over again. Like, oh, what did it say on page 36? Um, can we take questions during the thing? Or OK, you just have to go up to the microphone to take to, to ask. I was going to ask, what is a website contract? Uh, um, that's a very general term for terms and conditions and things like that. I just call them generally. It covers privacy policies, too. That's a good question. What's a website contract? That's the shorthand for those types of contracts. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so just going through merchants, or merchant in this instance, um, you have website contracts, journal terms and conditions, payment terms and conditions, and privacy policy. That actually asks, answers the question right there. Um, and uh, you want to have network contracts that protect your intellectual property. It's very important about how your IP is used. There are certain instances, if you don't protect your intellectual property, you can lose it. Um, so you definitely want to protect it. If you don't enforce your IP, um, that courts can rule that your IP is no longer enforceable. So it's very important to enforce your IP. Um, you also want to identify, uh, try to obtain identification for legal wrongs by your networks and by your affiliates. Um, so that way, if they do something wrong, they can indemnify you. Um, and just a really quick primer on what's indemnification. Um, Taylor, raise your hand for a second. If uh, Taylor goes out and you could put it, <laughs> and knock somebody over the head, but we have an indemnification agreement where I indemnify him for his legal wrongs, you would sue. You know, I would step in and, and pay for the legal proceedings. Um, Taylor would never do that, by the way. He's a nice guy. But if you ever did that, I would have to pay for his uh, legal proceedings and damages if I indemnify him for, for those actions. So um, also, of course, affiliate contracts are the same as uh, network contracts if working directly with affiliates. So uh, networks, affiliate networks, is, um, there may be a few here. You want to uh, have a good terms and conditions and privacy policy to the extent you have a website. Um, also, contracts with merchants. The problem that affiliates have is that you have a two-way two -way street here. You have to deal with the merchants, and you have to deal with the affiliates. So you have um, essentially uh, relationships, legal relationships going both ways. So it's very important to look out for both those ways. So uh, if you're using a merchant's intellectual property, you're giving your affiliates permission to do so. Why and how? Um, that's what those contracts should have. And I do tend to talk fast, and I apologize for that. I usually get paid by the word, so I like to given in as many words as possible. Um, you also want to try to obtain, and I'm also from New York, so two strikes. You also want to try and in, in, obtain indemnification for legal wrongs by the affiliates themselves, and you want to set payment conditions, of course. Uh, affiliate contracts also, of course, govern how affiliates advertise, and uh, you want to avoid indemnification, if possible, uh, up to the merchant's level. Now, affiliates, if applicable, terms and conditions, privacy policy, Website contracts. Um, of course, uh, network contracts. So you have a contract with your network, and that governs your relationship. Why and how uh, the intellectual property of the stuff you're selling can be used. And we'll have a slide on intellectual property in a second, just a quick primer on what that is and what you need to look out for. Um, but also, your network may try to obtain indemnification from you. If you do something wrong, um, you indemnify them uh, for that wrong. So if they get sued, or the merchant sues them, you have to step in and pay for those legal proceedings or whatever damages they are. And of course, there are merchant contracts if you're working directly with the, uh, with the merchant itself. So those are the three things to look out for. Now, I always get the question, um, so if you, if you already know this, uh, forgive me for this really quick thing, but everyone always asks, what is intellectual property? And intellectual property, I give a really short answer, it's everything. Um, this screen has been subject probably of a patent or two. The text on the screen you see that I wrote is subject to an automatic copyright. When you write something, it's automatically copyrightable. Um, the logo in the corner, center logo, logo has been trademarked. So everything that you see around you, your logo, your text, is copyrightable. So for instance, I have a lot of clients that have this issue with copyright stuff. You write copy, 
and somebody else copies your copy, nice sentence, that's copyrightable, and you have a legal uh, case against them if you want to. Um, you can send them a cease and desist letter. You could just call them up and tell them to stop, shoot them an email, or whatever it is. Um, you take a picture of a product that you want to advertise, that's copyrightable too. Now, you can't copyright the logo that's of the product, but you can copyright the elements, the artistic elements that you have when you're shooting the product. Um, that's a very common thing that we have. I have a case right now involving two e-retailers going back and forth, my, my clients being sued because uh, my clients supposedly use photographs off this other website of products that were shot in such a way and uh, that made them look quote unquote artistic even though it was just a shot on of a product. So you have to be very careful about things like that. The interesting thing about copyrights is anytime you create something, it's automatically copyrighted. You don't have to run to the copyright office, you don't have to file anything, you don't have to do anything else. By virtue of you writing it, virtue of you taking that picture, it's copyrighted, that's it. Um, and uh, now there are advantages to, to registering a copyright. For instance, if you register a copyright and somebody copies your copy, you have automatic statutory damages which are more than $100,000 per, per claim. If you don't register it, you have just actual damages where if somebody does it and uh, you, have to, um, you have to prove that you lost profits or that they gained profits because of copying your copy, so to speak. So um, with copyrights, that's a big thing. Uh, going back up to trademarks, um, that includes a logo, the name, uh, the trade dress. Trade dress is a very fancy word to say, essentially, um, uh, the Pepto-Bismol bottle, the pink, that's trade dress. Um, the Coca-Cola bottle, the shape that's unused, you know, that's germane to Coca-Cola, that's trade dress. So those things are all trademarks. Um, and also violating a trademark can lead to significant statutory damages as well. Um, but uh, in both of them, with trademarks and copyrights, if they are registered, the person who is suing, doing the suing can get attorney's fees as well from you for, for protecting their own trademarks and copyrights. And then there's other intellectual property, trademarks and trade secrets, excuse me, and patents. Um, I won't talk about patents because I really don't know much about them, so I don't want to talk out of turn. Um, but trade secrets is a big area of litigation, um, especially with the economy tightening. You see a lot of people jumping ship from one company to another. They take uh, customer lists, information, your business know-how to another company, that's a trade secret. And uh, you can, in some instances, stop them from spreading that know-how somewhere else. So the next section of this is casino. How many people have been here to the casino? All right. Now, the question is, um, I'll pick roulette. Uh, they actually do war here, which is pretty cool. Um, I used to remember playing that when I was like eight years old. Um, I never won there then, so I probably shouldn't play it now. But if, would you think somebody was silly for walking into a casino and playing roulette if they had no idea the rules of roulette? So they just always put one chip down on red and one on black and spun, and then they won half the time and lost half the time. They actually won all the time and lost all the time. Um, so the question is, would you go into a casino game without knowing the rules? And the answer would hopefully be no. And um, I would say your business is not a casino. You should know the rules of the game before you enter into the game, so to speak. And it's just as silly to do so in this sense than it is when you walk into a casino and playing a casino game without knowing the rules. For instance, blackjack, if you thought it went up to 18, you'd have some problems at the blackjack table. Um, so don't do that, by the way. It's 21, in case you don't know. So um, there's a few risks that you have, and these are some of the rules of the road that you should probably know going ahead. One is the Federal Trade Commission, everyone's favorite commission, right? Um, so they monitor a lot of things, including advertising claims um, and uh, claims that are made. So one, where, one area, somebody asked me yesterday, we were sitting at lunch, and somebody asked me yesterday, what, are they, what is FTC really looking at? Um, one of the two things that they're really looking at now is this whole deceptive format thing. And you see a lot of cases, a lot of claims about uh, that FTC is bringing against companies for deceptive format advertising. So for instance, if it looks like a news article and it's really about the product and it's not a real news article, that's a deceptive format. Also, uh, fake endorsements is a big thing that they're looking at. And of course, unsubstantiated claims. I've lost 30 pounds in one, one single minute. Um, unless you lopped off somebody's arm, that's not really possible. So um, they're looking at unsubstantiated claims as well. Another thing they're really looking at, which may or may not apply to some of the people here, is the business opportunity rule. If you've heard about it now, that's a new thing that they're really doing, and they've really tried to shut down um, business uh, opportunity uh, claims and things like that. So stuffing envelopes at home kind of thing. Um, it hasn't really affected the affiliate marketers very much. Excuse me. I just had a niche there. 
Um, but if you have a business opportunity that you're promoting, um, you could fall into this rule. It's a very gray line. Um, see me afterwards and I'll talk to you about it and I can tell you whether I think it falls under it um, based on what you tell me if this is an area that you're in. But if you have a business opportunity, you have to disclose seven days in advance of somebody signing on the dotted line for that business opportunity, um, the seller's information, uh, the likely earnings that you'll have, if you've been sued before, what the refund policy is, and who, 10 of your customers, including their address, not their address, their phone number and their location. So good luck getting your customers to agree to disclose that. Um, so they're really trying to not tramp down on, on, on possible wrongs that are being happened happening within this whole business opportunity thing. They're really trying to shut down the whole business, as you can see, based on this rule. Now, people complain that this is really overly restrictive, and the FTC fired back and said, no, it's not. We're going to require 20 things, not those five things that were disclosed. I have no idea what those other 15 things would have been, maybe the blood type of the person selling the uh, offer. I really don't know. But those five things are pretty, pretty ridiculous. So if you have a business opportunity, come and see me afterwards, and I'll tell you whether I think it falls into the rule. No promises that I'll be able to tell you right away, but uh, I should be able to. Um, risk number two, which a lot of people don't talk about, is state attorney general investigations. I deal with this a lot, um, but you don't really hear it very much in this space. Um, you're giving an offer on the web. A uh, customer gets the offer. Free trial, right? Then they get, start getting charged a monthly fee. This is something that happens quite a bit. And somebody complains to the consumer authority within that state. And that consumer authority a lot of times refers that complaint to the state attorney general. And that's when you start having a lot of other problems. I've had clients where I've been just nonstop writing response letters to state's attorney generals for like a couple weeks at a time, saying, no, this is a very fair offer. You know, if the disclosure was very prominent on the page, da da da, they've given a refund to this person. Because the last thing you want to happen is a state attorney general to start investigating an offer or a company. And in fact, there was one client that we had where it was happening so much they had to shut down. So uh, fortunately for them, they were in a different country. So State attorney generals couldn't really come after them, but they really had to shut down uh, their business as they were doing it. And uh, this especially happens, like I said, with the free trial complaints, but any kind of consumer offering that you have, be on the lookout for state attorney general complaints because they are, they are real and they're very important, and they actually usually start by somebody. Most states now have a form online where if you want to complain about a company, you can. And uh, there's somebody in their, their office there that will look at the, uh, these complaints and filter them and say, all right, this person's not being not being ridiculous, we should forward this to the Attorney General. So the problem with the state Attorney Generals, too, is that there are 50 of them. There's only one federal government, but there are 50 state Attorney Generals. So it's really important that uh, you stay on top of those, if you get any of those complaints, to resolve them right away and show why that there, there wasn't an issue. Um, because if you don't do that, they may, it may warrant further investigation. The idea is that you don't want to have two or three, if possible, more than two or three from a state, because then they'll see a pattern and, and, and investigate further. Or you don't want to leave them unanswered, even if you answer them yourself and explain why there, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, it's really important to just address them head on and deal with them, because they will not leave you alone. Um, I've seen that tried before, it doesn't work. <laughs> Especially with states with lower populations where they have people with not enough to do. <laughs> you want to address those especially. Risk number three, the Can Spam Act, everyone's favorite act. Um, but some people say can spam means you can spam, as long as you follow certain rules and regulations. Um, so you want to ensure that soliciting emails that are sent out are in compliance with the Can Spam Act. Um, in fact, we send out soliciting emails, and we have to ensure that they're compliant with the Can Spam Act. So we, um, we know very well how to comply with the Can Spam Act because we do it ourselves. Um, and of course, risk number four um, is the violation of IP rights. This is a huge thing. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about IP is it's that it's, um, it changes all the time. The interesting thing about this whole field is it's that it's pretty relatively new. It hasn't been around for 100 years. And uh, if somebody, somebody's dog bites somebody else, you could look back in 1912 or 1684, the year, and figure out what happened back then and apply that law to the case that you have now. If you have somebody selling, putting a trademark, uh, using a trademark trigger for a CPC campaign, um, there's not a lot of case law on that. There's probably only about a dozen cases that have resolved that issue. I have one of them right now. I'm working on one of them right now, actually, in federal court. And, uh, the law has gone back and forth, actually, in the last 10 years or so, where the law of the land for a while was you can't use somebody, a competitor's trademark when buying uh, Google AdWords. Now it's pretty safe to do so, based on the cases that have come out. So um, just something to keep an eye on. But the thing with IP in this field is that it's very murky, because the law seems to change back and forth based on the judges, the quality of the judges that are hearing cases. The interesting thing is, and this is a dirty little secret that lawyers won't usually tell you, is that a lot of these cases are resolved 
uh, before a jury hears it by a judge who doesn't know anything about the internet, right? And that's a problem. And a bigger problem is a lot of times it's prosecuted and defended by lawyers who don't understand the internet. So you have case law that is out there, and these cases are nonsensical, and they are the law of the land, so to speak, but they're written by a judge who doesn't know anything about what he's or she is writing about, prosecuted and defended by attorneys who don't know the space at all. So you have this law that's terrible, and it's because you have parties involved who know nothing about the space at all. So it's always good to keep on top of uh, IP rights and what's going on in the IP field and, uh, and things like that because you want to try to avoid the jurisdictions where those cases have been decided, if possible, when you're considering bringing or defending a legal action. Um, sometimes you can't help it if you're defending, but sometimes you can move it around. So, for instance, um, we're called Center Law Group. Can a competitor law firm buy our, our name as a Google AdWord uh, to trigger a Google AdWord? Now, most courts will say yes. Um, can you embed, the, we had one case about uh, metadata, where they were, a competitor was in the metadata. Not, and then this is part of the problem, is the court didn't realize that Google doesn't really look at the metadata anymore. That was maybe 10 years ago, if then, even longer. Um, and because the court didn't realize that the Google doesn't look at the metadata, you got a bad decision out of that case because you didn't, they didn't know that metadata, putting a trademark in metadata wouldn't, somebody else's trademark in your own metadata wouldn't really get um, you up in the Google rankings because the Google bot doesn't realize, doesn't even look at that to know that you have somebody else's trademark in your metadata. So a lot of interesting things out there. And that's all to say it's very murky. Um, but uh, if you're planning on doing something, if think maybe on the iffy side, or if somebody is doing something you think is on the iffy side, you should try to look it up, contact somebody who's in the space, and uh, talk to them for a couple minutes and see what they think. So now that I've gone on that little spiel about trademark rights, uh, from a merchant's perspective, what are the risks um, that you have? Uh, one, you have your networks and, and affiliates who can vi vi violate various laws. Not that they would ever do that, since there are a lot of affiliates in this room. And um, you have networks and affiliates who will use the IP um, of the merchant without the permission or use it in a way that the merchant doesn't want to. You could draw the ire of the uh, FTC. Uh, maybe the product doesn't function properly, and that just means that it doesn't function in the way that the merchant, the affiliate is advertising in a different way than the merchant built it for or intended it to uh, function. And it uh, doesn't work in accordance with the claims by, made by the advertisers. So from a Merchant's perspective, what are your best practices? And I'll just talk to you right now. <laughs> What's your best practices? You want to have ironclad contracts um, with the networks and affiliates, and you want to include identification provisions if possible. Um, you want to monitor them to make sure that they're complying. Uh, I always recommend so, uh, timely just going out on the internet, seeing what's out there, and doing some random monitoring, even if, if you're big enough, having a person dedicated to doing that. And uh, do some research who you should use as a network partner. Uh, don't, just, uh, don't just go with somebody because they have a slick website. So do they have a good compliance history? So from a network's perspective, what are the risks out there? Um, sometimes you're caught in the middle between the affiliates and the merchants. You get the worst of both worlds, but you also can get the best of both worlds. Um, you have affiliates. Not that they'd ever do this, but they could violate various laws, misappropriate IP, of course, draw the air of uh, FTC. Um, and of course, the products doesn't, don't work properly or in accordance with how the merchant intended. And from a network's perspective, what are your best practices? Well, you, have, you must have ironclad contracts with the merchants and with your affiliates. You want to make sure that you include identification if possible with your affiliates. And be, be aware the merchant may have identification provision in your contract with them, so you, can, you have to identify them if your affiliates do anything wrong. And you want to make sure that the affiliates are compliant with the various state laws that are out there and federal laws. And research, sometimes you should research who you use as an affiliate. I have clients who don't like to do this, and I, that's understandable. It's a, um, it's a tough business out there, but I always recommend doing a little bit of research on the affiliate uh, before they bring them on if possible. I mean, the reality is that doesn't really happen, but uh, if you can, that's, I'm just giving you best practices. So affiliate's perspective, what are your risks? Um, you may be unaware of the federal laws out there and the state laws out there that govern what you're doing. Um, you may unwittingly, because you don't understand or know what the contract says, or maybe you never saw the contract, you may be using the IP that the merchant has in a way that um, they are not really letting you use it, and they're not permitting. You could uh, draw, of course, the ire of the FTC by making claims that, that you shouldn't be making, like we said earlier. And maybe the merchant's pr product doesn't work properly. Maybe actually their merchant is selling a defective product, and all of a sudden they're going to come after you because you, um, if they find you. 
because you uh, advertise a defective product. And of course, the merchant's product doesn't work in accordance with what the advertisers said they work. So this is just the various risks that, mer that affiliates have. I would say, on a whole, though, really the affiliate to network relationship is the one that's most important, not the affiliate to consumer uh, relationship. So from an affiliate perspective, what are the best practices? You want, to have, you want to understand the contract that you have with whoever you have a contract with. If it's with a network, you understand what you're supposed to do with the IP. Um, you want to understand uh, how you're going to be paid, when you're going to be paid. Is there a cap on uh, like, uh, cost per action? Is there a ca cap on CPL? Um, is there a cap on CPC? And what happens if you exceed that cap? Do you get paid at all, or do you get paid less, or, or how it works? So you want to try to figure that out first, so then you can know how to, how to uh, aim resources, right? You also want to um, maybe try to negotiate any kind of terms of contention, how and when you get paid if possible. Now, a lot of affiliate networks won't negotiate, and that's just you have to look at the contract and see if it's something you're willing to accept. Um, of course, if you can, you want to ensure that the product claims that you're making are accurate, OK? And evaluate each advertisement, make sure it complies with the FTC best practices. And of course, um, if you're sending out emails, that they comply with the CAN Spam Act. The CAN Spam is actually fairly easy to uh, comply with, um, as long as you, uh, you can even go on Wikipedia and look up CAN Spam, and it'll tell you what you have to do, usually with CAN Spam. Or you could shoot me an email, and I could give you a list back. It's pretty easy to comply with. OK, that is a 12 and a half week old fetus, now 15 weeks old. I'll tell you. I found out election night my wife was pregnant, right? She'd probably kill me if she knew I was telling you all this, and it's on video too. And uh, I was actually at an election party, and I came back and, and uh, took, she took a test and told me, and now you probably think I'm a big geek, I was at an election party. And uh, I won't tell you if I was happy or sad after the, at the end of the party. And when she told me, for five minutes I was totally elated. It was like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me, this is better than graduating law school, passing the bar, getting married, I just can't believe that we actually did this, da da da, da. And about five minutes later, I started to panic. I said, holy cow, what if she miscarries? What, what happens if there's a chromosomal abnormality on, with the fetus and something happens? What if it has Down syndrome? What happens if my wife, who commutes to work using the metro, falls down the stairs and hits her stomach and something happens and there's a spontaneous um, miscarriage or something like that? So I was just panicking. And that panic has not stopped to this day. And I realize now, upon some reflection, that that panic is going to be happening for the rest of my life. After the child is born, what happens if their friend, they don't have any friends? What happens if they don't get into a good school? What happens if they find nobody to have a relationship with and marry? What happens if they don't have a good, it goes on and on and on. Believe it or not, this is like your company. There are exterior, falling down the metro stairs and hitting it, and there are interior, chromosomal abnormalities, things like that happening. Um, that can happen with your company. The interior things can be just as serious as the exterior, though they can both result in a company going out of business. And I give this talk to people, actually. I've never used this before, because I've never been able to. Um, but, um, and it's usually met with a lot of skeptical people, like, oh, I have a handle on things. I know what's going on. My business partner would never do that to me. Or um, you know, my customers would never do that. They love our product. They love our service, whatever. Um, but believe it or not, it happens. And in fact, uh, we just had a case where it went to verdict with a rogue employee um, in December, and I'll tell you about it in a second, just to give you an example of how it can happen. So here are some internal things that can happen. Now, if you think a fetus is, um, is a delicate object that, or a delicate being that you should take care of and, and be careful with, actually companies are sometimes even more vulnerable than like a fetus would be. And when I show you all the things that can happen, you probably, hopefully would agree with me. So you have internal issues. For instance, you have rogue employees and business partners who can steal trade secrets, um, attempted corporate takeover, which is not really a corporate takeover, engage in cyber attacks or hiking, hacking, uh, try to misappropriate the uh, property of the company, and go loco. Yes, that does happen. Um, and of course, you have employ partners who engage in hacking. So hacking is a really interesting thing. Um, if, if none of you are, you should be familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It's a federal statute, and the idea of the federal statute was to prevent people from hacking into systems, right? The courts have had a very expansive look on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. In fact, trial that we just had in December that I was just talking, talking to you about, part of the verdict was we were able to convince the jury 
that there was a computer fraud and abuse act violation when, among other things, the former employee disconnected, unplugged the computer system and, and rendered it useless for a couple days. That was a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. There was a case that came out um, in the Sixth Circuit, and uh, it was a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act violation when somebody did a phone, they, 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 uh, they essentially used a computer to, to call this number over and over again and tied up this company's computer, this phone system. But now phone systems are computer systems, right? Everything is a computer now. So uh, that rendered the phone system of the company useless, but that was a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act case because the, computer the uh, phone system was considered a computer system. So um, a lot of things are Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but the, the really important thing to understand with, the, with that act is that if you have authorized access to authorize an email, um, some internal system, um, an account, and you exceed that authorization by doing anything at all, that could be a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act case. And it's a federal uh, criminal and civil statute. We operate under the civil side, but there's also, um, if a prosecutor is so inclined, they could, they could see criminal charges in the circumstances. So of course, then you have external issues. Um, if you've never been defamed on the internet, it's not a pleasant thing. Um, I once had an opposing party. I was, in, I was representing a client and the opposing party, not the opposing attorney, but the opposing party, bought a the domain name that said ericcruciasucks.com. So that was fun, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I remember when that happened, and I was really, I was kind of perturbed by it. This was about six or seven years ago, and I wanted to go sue the guy, naturally. And uh, my wife, we weren't married at the time, but she's my wife now. She said, you know what, don't do anything. Just ignore it. The page had mo was mostly empty, just had a couple of things on it. It'll probably just go away. And actually, that's what happened. It went away. After about a year, he didn't renew the domain name. I've since bought it so it doesn't happen again. <laughs> Lesson learned, everybody. <laughs> and um, and uh, it just went away. So sometimes when these things happen, these externalities, if they're not really hurting you, it's better to leave them alone and the person will move on to some other target. But sometimes you have no choice but to deal with it, and I'll show you that. Now, talking about the internal issue, this is the case that just went to trials, reported extensively by the Washington Business Journal. They seem to take an interest in it for some reason. And um, it was, this is a former HR manager. Now, if you have staff, this, applies to, this could apply to your company. This uh, HR manager, uh, when she was working there, came into contact with a lot of personal and company information. And this isn't a big company, so um, she pretty much knew everything about the company. Um, this HR manager, when she was criticized, did not take it very well and would go on late night rants, emailing her superior, who was the vice president of the company, saying, you know, I think you're wrong, da da da, you're beating a dead horse, this and that. And uh, it was getting kind of scary. So they decide to fire her, and, uh, and in the interim, they discovered when, before they fired her, but after the last uh, brouhaha, that she had come in over the weekend and disconnected the computer system. And uh, there was a finance server that had all the finance information on it. They changed the BIOS startup, she changed the BIOS startup sequence, which you could actually do just by clicking a couple buttons. And, uh, and did that and rendered the finance server useless for a while until they figured out how to change that. that. And then she was terminated. And after she was terminated, she used her confidential HR information and spread it around to the company. Um, for instance, there was a complaint filed by one employee against another employee. She emailed that other employee the complaint, things like that. It got pretty ugly for a while, so we went and had to go into court, get an injunction to stop her. Um, and eventually, um, we tried to settle. She would not settle, so we took it to trial. And a jury of, of her peers found her liable for the tune of $300,000, including punitive damages. Not a, not a huge verdict, but considering the damages, I think it was a pretty good verdict. And uh, they say they're gonna, going to appeal, we'll see. But that's, that's an example of an internal issue. Now, this is somebody that had a lot of trusted information, and think about your business partners and who you have and the information that they have, and uh, how much do you trust them? And I'm not saying you shouldn't trust people. What I'm saying is have controls in place to make sure that you're protecting your company. It's very delicate, your company. Um, one rogue employee, and she's still trying to ruin this company, our client. One, one rogue employee can ruin your company. So this isn't exactly affiliate related, but I think it's very important for all companies to know about. And it, ever since this case was filed and then happened, I've tried to talk to people when I've given presentations about it because I think it's pretty valuable. So th these are some external um, issues. Um, have you guys heard of ripoff report before? Okay, 
I've had some dealings with Ripoff Report before, as you can imagine. And uh, if you don't know already, they uh, run a complaint website. And uh, if, if a complaint is filed about you or your company, you can actually not get it taken down, but get it uh, altered. Or there could be a headline, a very positive headline, where Ripoff Report has investigated the complaint. And they think um, this is a good company and they do good business. Uh, but they'll only do that if you enter into their corporate advocacy program, which requires a down payment and a monthly fee for a certain amount of years. I will not comment on that program, but I will say that that program has been held up as being legal in courts. So um, you know, people have sued to get the stuff taken down and has not worked. Um, Ripper Report has some good lawyers, I guess. There's also one called complaintsboard.com that's very similar. Complaints Board is written by some, is, is the rumor is anyway, that it's run by somebody in Eastern Europe. I had a client who had a problem with Complaints Board and uh, General Counsel took care of it in a different way, how they take care of things in Eastern Europe. Um, but that complaint is no longer on Complaints Board. Um, also, you have review sites such as Yelp.com. Um, you have dedicated hate websites. Um, Google AdWords, of course, uh, social media, and domain name uh, squatting, cyber squatters. Cyber squatting, at least I've seen in my practice, is actually in an uptick right now. You see a lot of people uh, squatting uh, in different names and things like that um, to try to try to gleam off some of your golden uh, name, uh, and at least they can get a silver, I guess. So um, like I said, complaint websites are, are, are a website where anyone can file a complaint. They don't really require any kind of verification that the complaint is accurate or real or anything like that. And the, the problem with, um, with, uh, complaint, with rip off report and complaints board, if they have very good SEO, so if somebody searches for your company and you have a company and you want to keep up the reputation, a lot of times their complaint will be higher than your corporate uh, website. But I am talking to a room of people who are very good with SEO probably, so you could probably find a way around that if you wanted to. And uh, um, just a little word about SEO, not that you really need to know about this. Um, there are billions of searches a month on Google. There's probably about 10 billion a month right now, um, more than 100 billion a year. Google accounted for 65%, uh, of it's holding steady about 65% of all searches. And Yahoo and Bing, they're still there. Um, you may not know it. I, I, uh, I get the SEO of our, we have an internet law blog, um, and I could tell you about it afterwards. But I, I look at where people are coming from every day. And we occasionally get a, a Bing or a Yahoo person, but it's mostly Google. Um, this is a good example. Here's a company that um, Harvard Risk Management. And you see the second result there is something from Ripoff Report, because they have good SEO. So, um, and when somebody, so when somebody's searching your, for, for your company, guess which link they're going to click on. They're not going to click on the first link, which is your website. They're going to click on the Ripoff Report. And at least that's what I would do, because that that's far more interesting than your website. So, and this is what the ripoff report looks like there. For those of you not familiar, um, you could see um, in big lead letters, big lead, red letters, wow, I've, I've discovered today I'm dyslexic. Uh, Harvard Risk Management Corporation, Mark H. Riches, that's a pretty cool name actually, CEO, Pyramid Scheme, prepaid legal, legal shield products, and Platinum Executive Director, Dallas, Texas. And then it goes on and talks about what a terrible person that is, and so on and so forth. Now, if you entered into the corporate ad advocacy program, it would say something like, Ripoff Report is reviewed. Harvard Risk Management finds they have great business practices, and da 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 and then this would be below it. So they never take anything down. What they'll do is they'll put a little primer up front, uh, so long as your monthly fee keeps coming in, uh, that says how wonderful you are. And then there's one called pissconsumer.com, if you guys are not familiar. Now, this is a really interesting website, because what they do is, say your uh, web domain is center law. Right, centerlaw.com, where's centerlawgroup.com? So what PISC Consumer will do is in their domain name, they'll have www.centerlawgroup.pissconsumer.com, and then I'll be a page dedicated to people who hate you. Um, sounds wonderful, right? So actually, a lawyer had a pretty neat idea, and he said, well, that's a trademark violation because that target company name is a trademark, and uh, they're, they're keying off your name. And the court said, well, and they do reputation management services too, by the way, you're over there. Well, that's not really a trademark violation, because part of the idea of having a trademark violation is that somebody is confused. There has to be an element of confusion. Like, they don't know if it's your company or somebody else's company. They think it's your company when they go to the website. And the court essentially said, nobody will ever mistake centerlawgroup.pissconsumer.com was part of Center Law Group or Center Law Group website, because they wouldn't think that we'd be having a hate website in ourselves. 
So these kind of websites which use domain names or use your name um, are generally permissible in the trademark sense because um, they really essentially are not confusing anybody. They know that this is a website dedicated to hating you, not part of you. So um, it's really difficult to, um, to, do, to uh, win these kind of cases. Now, on the other hand, there is de defamation, which is a very common thing. Probably half the calls I get are about defamation, uh, not just from affiliate marketers, but just from people who have a web presence. Even people who don't have a web presence um, uh, have internet defamation problems. And um, it's really difficult to attack, like rip off report and piss consumer for defamation claims because there's a statute out there that act, essentially acts as a bar to suing them for the, excuse me, defamatory material. Now, you can try to go after the people who supply the defamatory material, but that requires filing a John Doe lawsuit, essentially a lawsuit against nobody, and then subpoenaing various websites to try to find out the identity of the person. And it's a little bit of a slodge, a slug, to do so, but it is possible to do so in a lot of instances. In fact, that uh, case I just was telling you about with the, um, with the uh, HR manager, one thing that she did was she posted on the web how terrible this company was, they were violating all these laws, da 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 da, and she posted it under pseudonyms. We were able to subpoena a bunch of websites and a few of them responded and identified her and her actually her IP address. And she had voluntarily disclosed her IP address to us, thankfully, and we were able to match the two up and uh, present that to the jury as well. So, um, of course, there are review sites like Yelp. Yelp is an interesting website. Um, any, anybody here, before I go on to this part, affiliated with Yelp? Okay. Um, they filter, as you can see on the screen, um, various um, reviews. Now, some will say that this is based on an algorithm. Um, this algorithm will filter reviews that they think are, that Yelp thinks the Yelp bot or Yelp computer thinks are worthless or are um, astroturfing, essentially. Some will argue that these are filtered depending on whether you purchase advertising on Yelp.com or not. I will not say which I think. But if you wanted to get those filtered reviews, you have to enter, if you've probably done this before, this word that you can't even read, and you put it in there, and you click read reviews, and then after the fifth try, you eventually get it right. And uh, you're able to, to do that. This is a client that I represented at a time when I worked for a different firm. Um, but this was a, a dentist in San Francisco who had very um, negative reviews on Yelp but also a lot of hidden positive reviews. And this occurred right after Yelp tried to sell this dentist advertising and she did not, was not interested in the advertising. All of a sudden her reviews on Yelp got very bad. And um, so uh, the d dentist essentially sued Yelp. I think it's still in litigation now, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, dentist also sued, by the way, the people who made the reviews. That's a whole other story. But, um, uh, did sue Yelp uh, for what, what, what the dentist called a shakedown scheme because what it was happening is the Yelp reviews are pretty good before. All of a sudden, negative reviews went to the top after she said no to the advertising. And then um, I think she since bought advertising on the site. So it actually did work. Good, good for Yelp. And then, of course, there's dedicated hate websites. I used to work at Dozier Internet Law, which who was around these parts before. Unfortunately, he's passed away uh, recently. Um, and uh, there was actually a dedicated hate website to him, um, and I think it was called uh, Dozier Internet Law Sucks or something like that, and that's a uh, dedicated hate website for that. Um, it's usually easy to identify the person who has a dedicated hate website against you because you know where they're coming from. They'll usually be very proud of their website, so they will identify themselves for you, which makes it very easy if you want to sue them. So that's kind of nice. And of course, there's the Google AdWords. Less of a problem now than it was before because the case law is kind of swung back towards people who want to buy competitor, um, uh, competitor uh, keywords when, when, when uh, that triggers an ad. Um, our firm actually buys keywords sometimes, so I'm very familiar with this space just as a, a practice. And of course, this is a very interesting one now, Google Autocomplete. I'm waiting for somebody to sue Google. I thought I had a client who was going to do it, and they decided not to do it. Um, hopefully, there's nobody from Google here. But uh, Google Autocomplete is something that's really interesting. So if you start typing something into Google, of course, there's a pop-down, right? All these uh, Ackerberries are really, was very popular at one time. And you can see, here's Scam, right? Our client, when you typed in their name, one of the first results in Google Autocomplete was Scam. And they said, well, we're not a scam. We had demonstrable evidence that they were not a scam, but Google was kind of telling the world that they were a scam. 
So it, was, it made it very difficult for our clients to recruit new um, to clients of their own. So they're like, what can we do about this? They're actually, this has been litigated in a, a lot of uh, Europe, and uh, they've found against Google in this instance. But the problem is you have a statute in here which really prevents a lawsuit against Google for this, but our, we were gonna make an argument possibly that our, our client was a competitor to Google so we can get them on trademark violation. But the interesting thing is here is um, um, you have an algorithm that Google says is proprietary, of course, and it's automatic and you can't change it. But the interesting thing about that is that the word scam was removed from the algorithm for about three months back about two years ago. So it's definitely not an algorithm that's totally objective if they could add and remove words from the algorithm. And um, another interesting thing about it is uh, when somebody, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you type in somebody's name or company name and you see scam pop up, you're gonna, all right, I'm gonna click on scam. I wanna see what this is all about. And then all of a sudden, scam is staying on there. Even though there's no natural searches for scam anymore, maybe because nobody really believes it's a scam without seeing the suggestion, or they used to call it Google Suggest, now they call it autocomplete. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, what's your, and, I, and, I, and I go through this whole spiel, not because I'm looking for possible plaintiffs, but because I think it's really good. Of one, of, one of the things that you should do is when you're scrubbing the internet to see what your reputation is, is to start typing out your name slowly and seeing what pops up. And if you have a problem with what's popped up, um, there are ways that you could try to fix it, of course, through the internet. Um, and uh, you should be, just be, at least be aware that's out there because it may explain why you have a decrease in traffic in one area or, or, or something like that. And of course, if you have somebody handling your social media, this probably doesn't really apply to you so much. But uh, Nestle had a big brouhaha. Nestle's one of the biggest companies in the world. They had somebody using their, who, mar who managed their Twitter account who had an attitude problem. And, um, and uh, eventually they had to shut down their Twitter account and Facebook account for a short time until they straightened it out because people, they had a Facebook page where anybody could post anything and uh, they were posting negative things about, about, uh, about uh, Nestle. And um, you can see that this is actually from the Facebook page. Nestle's saying, oh please, it's not like we're censoring everything to allow only positive comments. So you could read the, you could read the sarcasm through the Facebook posting, but that's not a good idea for a Fortune 10 company to be doing. So, Long and short, short, if you have somebody managing your social media, you should make sure they don't have an attitude while they're doing it. Um, and of course, the problem that a lot of our clients have, domain name squatting, uh, cyber squatters purchased miskeyed names, they purchased the .net, the .org, um, variations on corporate names and other domain name extensions. One thing to keep in mind, let's just say your competitor is Twinkies, right? So Twinkies.com. All right, I'm gonna purchase Twinkiesnet.com. That's really awesome, it's close. Maybe people will be fooled into thinking it's Twinkies. The, the net at the end of your name does not get you out of a trademark violation. Courts have held that uh, .net, .com, .org, all those uh, TLD extenders, first level especially, um, extensions um, are not, don't excuse you from a trademark violation. So if you just add net, com, org to a company name, um, it's still um, that company's trademark. Just a little heads up. So, Sources of attacks on the internet and inside and outside the internet, unhappy former employees, competitors, extortionists, they are out there. And occasionally there is the legitimately unhappy customer and client, and it's best to deal with those um, as quickly as possible. So these are the different things that you could do to push back, and I know we're running low on time, so I'll just go through this really quick so to give you time for questions if you have them. Um, and uh, for review websites, of course, respond to the reviews. If there's a dedicated hate website, Try to figure out who it is. Maybe you could talk them off the ledge and get them to, to remove the hate website. I was actually dealing with a celebrity who had a hate website against him. And uh, he's like, I really want to sue the person. I said, why don't you just talk to them? Do you know who it is? And he's like, I think I know who it is. It was actually his mother-in-law. <laughs> Terrible, right? I cannot tell you who it is unless you give me five drinks. <laughs> um, no, I can't. But um, he, he actually talked to his mother-in-law and she took down the hate website. So that's a good way to go about it sometimes. So that's not probably a happy family, but uh, at, least, at least the celebrity does not have a hate website about him on the web anymore. So um, I guess that's the larger point is that sometimes there's copacetic ways to go about these things without running into court and suing, writing demand letters, things like that. If you can handle that that way, that's a much better way to do so. I mean, if, you can't, if, you have, if it doesn't work, then you go on and do what you have to do. But, um, and if, of course, if there's an ad word violation that's really bothering you, the key with ad word violations is the law is still up in the air a little bit where if somebody's buying your trademark and purchasing keywords and triggering their, their ads, 
Um, it may be worthwhile to pursue that because there's enough uncertainty in the law where you can probably at least file the complaint. But see what that keyword is actually doing. Find out, try to find out what that keyword is actually doing for them because a lot of these suits are involved 50 clicks or something like that. And they've spent, the attorneys have spent like a million dollars you know, litigating a claim and it, it's over 50 clicks that resulted in one sale. So um, you know, if you have somebody who's doing that to you, I would say, look, I'm going to sue you, but tell me how many, unless you tell me how many it is. And a lot of times they're like, it's only one sale, you know, and then you'll say back off and not worry about it. So sometimes it's better to do it like that because then you avoid having the issue where you bring a lawsuit over $12, right? You don't want to do that. That's really a bad idea. So, um, of course, if you have social media, you want to have a closed social media page maybe where people don't comment as much or at least train the people who are running the social media page not to hate on your customers or critics. critics. And uh, for domain names, good idea to contact a domain name owner and see if they'll do something without having to uh, bring an arbitration. There are UDRP proceedings, which are very streamlined proceedings where you can try to get your domain back or try to get a domain that you think belongs to you, and they're fairly inexpensive to do. Uh, Non-lawyers can do it. I always recommend a lawyer, not just because I am one, but it, um, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive, relatively speaking. Um, and this is what you have to prove if you bring a UDRP proceeding. That was a good segue there. Um, domain name is identical or, or confusingly similar. Um, the person registered doesn't have any rights to that mark. Um, they register it in bad faith. And um, three things. And you could also bring a lawsuit under the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act. Um, as a, an alternative if you want to go to court. So here's some best practices for your company, internal and external. Now, if you're just one person, you should just tell yourself these things. But if you have more than one person, um, these are all really good things uh, to tell them. First of all, you want to train your employees to do the right thing. Um, if you have employees, you're an affiliate, and you have employees who are working for you, um, let them know what your affiliate contract says so they know not to step over the bounds of what the contract says. Give them a primer, like a one-page primer, on what they can and can't do. Um, register your name at social media websites. I know that sounds really silly, but if you have a company name, even if you're not going to populate a Facebook page, register your name at Facebook so that way somebody who doesn't like you doesn't do it instead and start this hate website. Dealing with Facebook is kind of a pain when you try to get those things down. So it's, it's much easier just to, uh, and other websites too, it's just much easier to do it up front. Spend an hour or so and register for all of them. You don't have to worry about it. Um, of course, register your name for common TLD extensions, .com, .net, .org. Um, register your copyrights and trademarks. You may or may want, want to do this depending on how valuable they are. Like I said, a copyright is created upon creation. Um, same thing, essentially, you could argue with trademarks depending on how long you've used it and things like that. And a lot of states, by the way, have separate trademark laws. Generally not a concern. Texas has one now that's new. Um, if you violate somebody's trademark, you are, you are automatic death penalty in Texas. <laughs> but. Um, they're actually, their trademark law is very similar to the federal, federal law now. The penalties are very similar. Um, you want to, of course, monitor Google and other search engines and engage with the complaint websites to the extent that you can, and hopefully that uh, they won't uh, try to charge you an arm and a leg. And uh, these are the things that you can do before the sun sets today. And, uh, and this is not go to the casino and keep doing. And these are kind of all things that we're talking about here, but I think it's very helpful to have it on one slide. Um, you want to, of course, know what the, know what the rules of the game are. Um, if you don't know the rules, you're probably going to step over some lines that you shouldn't step over. So it's really important just to understand what the rules are. You wouldn't go into a casino, like I said, um, without knowing the rules of the game that you're going to play in the casino, um, except for slot machines because there are no rules. You just click the thing. But uh, in general, you wouldn't do that, and you shouldn't do it with your own business. You should know what the rules are. Um, so um, that's generally it. Um, you also, of course, you want to check the rights and responsibilities of your contracts to make sure that you understand what your contracts say. Um, it's, it, I always argue it's good to have a lawyer look at your contracts because um, you may, some things are sometimes more negotiable than you realize. Um, but uh, if you can possibly do that, you should really do that. Um, and that's uh, generally it, I think. Questions. <laughs> And uh, I'll just put this slide up. This is our information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I do tweet. I'm not always very good on Twitter, but I do tweet. And we have a blog that's updated a couple times a week, so feel free to um, take a look at it. And question, yeah. Uh, just, just very short ones. Um, so if an advertiser um, advertises like for a free char and then charges after that, and I, as an affiliate, put that ad out, can someone come back and sue me? I mean, technically, 
they can, but they usually can't find you, so it's not an issue. <laughs> um, Good. Yeah, it depends on, um, it, it really depends on the contractual relationship that you have with, um, with the merchant or with the network that you have. But usually, um, technically, the answer is, is yes, but the reality is it's almost always no. So it's not something I would worry about too much. I would make sure that the ads I'm putting out there are accurate because the FTC could get involved and they'll find out who you are. Okay. So I would definitely, I mean, the free trial stuff is, is controversial just because there is usually a disclaimer that's pretty big, but a lot of people just want the stuff so they don't read the disclaimer. Mm -hmm. So it really also depends on what it looks like. I would just look at it, see if it looks misleading to you. If it doesn't look misleading to you, I think you should be okay. Okay, thank you. The other question I have is, um, I, I just actually saw uh, something on LinkedIn now, uh, and it's in the contracting world, where um, I guess a website, uh, I'm not sure if this is the new word, scraped mm -hmm. information from another website, took their article or took information that they'd written, put it on their website, and then linked it to LinkedIn. And apparently they are in huge big trouble. Um, can you tell me why yeah. and, and help me understand how not to make, to make that same mistake? Yeah, so scraping is a really interesting thing and it's happened for a, a long while now. We've, I've had clients where they're, um, they have uh, advertisements, uh, personal ads and things like that, and they're scraped and put on a different website. And um, a lot of it rides on what the terms and conditions of the, web, other, the originating website is, whether it can be scraped. And also there's, a whole cop there's an issue of copyright. Um, that content that, as it was originally created, is protected by the Copyright Act. So if it's been scraped and moved somewhere else and not attributed, that's a violation of copyrights. Now you have some companies going out there, um, Right Haven, have you guys heard about Right Haven? They, they just purchased uh, the rights to sue people for copyright violations if they've copied all or part of a newspaper article off on a website. And put, so if there's an interesting newspaper article, you're like, oh, this is really interesting, I'm gonna put this on my blog, and you put it on your blog, and you put like a snippet of it on your blog. Right Haven would swoop in and sue you. Now, Right Haven's out of business now because the business model didn't work too well. The courts didn't like it. But there's two problems with that, possibly. One, the you might be violating the terms and conditions of the original website. And two, it could be copyright violation if it's not properly attributed to the original website. So if you reference it and you say, this is from this link or this is from this newspaper, then you're OK. If, if it's not violating their terms and conditions, I would look at their terms and conditions to see if you're allowed to do it. And they've, I, got, they've got to publish their terms and conditions on their website? They, they should if they want people to do stuff like that. Okay. Usually they're pretty one-sided, so I would definitely look at it. Like, same thing with deep linking. You could usually deep link to a website as long as they don't prohibit it in their terms and conditions. Um, I, would, I would always be wary of linking an entire article. I would usually do a snippet so they can't have an, any argument that you've done something wrong. I think that's best practice, even though technically you could usually get away with the whole article. I like to not do that. So if I'm tweeting and, I'm, and, I'm, and I put in an, an article link there, hey, check out this article, that's OK. Yeah, that should be fine. OK. Um, one last uh, question. Where do I go to register copyright? Um, well, there's the Copyright Office in beautiful Washington, DC. <laughs> um, I would just go to copyright.gov. And uh, they're, co registering and copyrights are really easy. Okay. Um, and you usually don't need a lawyer to do it. You can have a lawyer do it, but you usually don't need a lawyer. It's a very easy process. Okay. Um, but you could just shoot me an email if you have any questions along the way. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Or are we out of time? Uh, we have two more minutes. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that uh, for some sites you don't necessarily need a privacy policy or terms of service. Uh, and under what conditions would you recommend not doing that? Only if you're not taking any information from the people who are going to your site. So if you're not taking any information at all, it's very passive, then you usually um, don't need those things. Um, but if you're taking any kind of, even if it's like technical right. browser information, stuff like that, you should, which 99% of the websites out there are doing, it's probably best practices. No good reason not to have a terms on your website because you can make it very one-sided about what you're gonna do with their information and nobody reads them anyway. So uh, I would always have terms, privacy policy, can get you in trouble because if you violate your own privacy policy, the FTC doesn't like that. So, um, um, but I would, ha I would also have a private, I mean, best practice is to have both, but you can get away with not having either if you don't collect information. Okay, and do those have to be on separate pages or could you just make like a legal link with all, you know, both You could usually have it in one, but it should be, it should really? be a link that says terms and conditions and privacy policy. Okay. On the link. Sounds good, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I'll, be, I'll stay after if you have personal questions that you want to ask that are related to this. Um, but thank you for attending, and I hope uh, you learned something today. Thanks. Thanks.